the neighborhoods we live in, the air around us, the quality of our buildings inter intimately affect our health. The second observation is that with the explosion of big data, there is an opportunity to measure the contribution of those social determinants in a way we've never done that before. And the third observation is that although we understand the social determinants matter, although there is the capacity with big data to assess social determinants, we are not bringing the two together to inform decision-making. So we started the conversation about how can we catalyze a global conversation that says we should be paying attention to the data that can assess social determinants so we can make better decisions for health. As you can imagine, when we started having that conversation, it was before any of us had ever heard the words COVID-19. So the commission started and has unfolded during a time of COVID-19, which as everybody here in this call knows, has shaped all our lives and how we think about health. That I think has sharpened the work of the commission and really has made it more important than ever to think about how social determinants can be measured and how their measurement should inform decision-making. Because while everybody on the call recognizes that COVID-19 is a viral pandemic and that vaccines are a large part of the solution, the way we have in all over the world experienced COVID-19 has been inextricable from the social determinants that shape the world around us. In global inequities, in uh, COVID, in rates of COVID and the severity of COVID are directly mapped onto the uh, social determinants that shape the conditions of living within countries and between countries. So I think we are at this moment in the COVID-19 pandemic, recognizing that solutions to global health threats must involve certainly a biomedical approach, must involve better biosurveillance, better vaccination, but they also must involve paying attention to the foundations that generate health, to the social determinants that generate health in the world around us that really shape the quality of our everyday life and that shape our health. The Rockefeller Foundation has been um, making a lot of investments in thinking about the social determinants, thinking about um, uh, how that intersects with this pandemic and potentially with future pandemics. And our role and the commission has been to help catalyze our thinking in this area. We have 24 commissioners from all over the world, some of whom you're gonna be hearing from today. And uh, we will be issuing a uh, report that will be coming out uh, coincident with uh, the UN General Assembly in September of this year. There are also a number of um, academic products, a number of other reports that will be coming out from the work of the commission. And I want to formally thank all the commissioners who have given generously of their time to this effort and to everybody else who's been participating in a number of events that we are hosting. Please keep an eye out for, in the fall, we'll be doing a series of launches that will be partnered with regional organizations um, in each of the six continents. And we'll also be doing a number of uh, commission conversations with um, leading thinkers in the health and social determinant space, really as part of our effort to generate more conversation about social determinants of health, and in particular, how we can measure the social determinants to the end of making better decisions for health. Insofar as we started this work before we had ever imagined COVID, we are now in the middle of the COVID pandemic, I think, recognizing really the urgency of this work. It's, 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 not, it's not, not, not only simply important, it is urgent that we as a world understand that social determinants of health are a core part of a health agenda and that we need to take measurement of social determinants, assessing social determinants and acting on social determinants as the inextricable part of generating health as it's always been. Thank you all for joining us today. Today, we have a number of speakers and uh, panelists who are gonna be really speaking about this broader agenda. And it's my great privilege to launch the program by introducing Dr. Jennifer Layden. Dr. Layden is Deputy Director for the Office of Science at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention in the United States. She is uh, leading the Strategic Science Unit at the CDC's COVID-19 response. And before this was the Chief Medical Officer of the Chicago COVID-19 response. She has also led several components of the CDC's data modernization efforts, which I think gives her really unique perspective at the intersection of the determinants of health and data to assess those determinants that really are the subject of the commission. Dr. Leiden, it's great to have you with us. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you to the Rockefeller Foundation, Boston University Commission on Health Determinants, Data and Decision Making, the 3D Commission, for hosting this timely and important event, addressing the importance in the intersection of data, social determinants of health, and policy and programs to improve the health of our global communities. Thank you for providing the opportunity for the CDC 
the US CDC to be part of this important conversation. And thank you to all those that organized and planned this event, the World Health Assembly, uh, all the speakers uh, and experts and participants who are taking time out of their busy day to add to this dialogue. As we are all well aware, health disparities and disparities across communities are far too common. The 3D Commission leads an impressive initiative to combine the power of data and insights from social determinants of health to inform decisions to improve the health of our communities. CDC shares in this vision and is developing an agency-wide comprehensive health equity science and intervention strategy with a vision to reduce and ultimately eliminate inequities in health by addressing the structural and social conditions that give rise to them. This work can only happen if we invest in public health infrastructure, the workforce, capacity and training, impact evaluation, partnership cultivation and collaboration, as well as data modernization efforts. Data has always been a core component of public health. Uh, and as we modernize our use of data, we must rapidly leverage the evolving field of data science to not just identify and describe health disparities, but to identify, understand, and address the root causes, both direct and indirect, that give rise to health inequity and poor outcomes. We all know that where we live, work, play, learn has a large impact on an individual and community's health outcomes. Being able to effectively leverage data to identify and describe these root causes is a critical an essential step to enabling implementation of effective and accessible programs and to inform decision-making. As we advance our abilities to acquire, use, and share big data, it is essential that we do so in a way that efficiently and accurately captures meaningful data. Data that describes and allows for the analyses of social determinants of health and place-based factors. And that we do so in a way that allows communities people in leadership and with power to make informed decisions based on these data. Simply put, we need not only data for action, but good and complete data for action. Before joining the CDC last summer, I was at the state level working as a state epidemiologist and the deputy commissioner for Chicago's Department of Public Health. Chicago is a large city with highly diverse populations. And as the COVID pandemic unfolded, we saw large disparities with our black and brown communities having higher disease incidence, yet often lower testing volumes and fewer testing sites in their communities. Sadly, hotspots of disease burden were present that seemed to only grow in size. In addition to looking at the traditional markers of disease and the demographic variables such as age, gender, uh, we began to pull in other data sets to help identify community level indicators associated with disease burden. Because of advancing technology and data modernization, we were able to visualize this information in near real time. Working with the mayor's office, we began weekly reviews of this data uh, down to a very small level, community level in zip codes, pulling in not only disease burden measures, but also population factors. And this helped to drive our decisions where to place community-based testing sites. With time, we saw that putting free community-based testing sites that were easy access in communities with high disease burden, yet low testing volumes was an effective way to ensure sufficient testing to communities with the highest burden. Strategies like this can only work when the technology is present to capture and visualize the data. The right data are captured. There are people who are trained to analyze and use the data and communities and leaders are empowered to act upon the data. Importantly, as we imagine and plan for how big data can be used to help examine and leverage social determinants of health, it is important that we do so in a way that makes sense at the community level. Technology and advances in big data have the potential to help communities across the world understand and address community level health outcomes. Yet the same data and data sets may not be relevant for all communities. We need to use data that most effectively helps to describe the community informed decisions at the community level. A simple example can be observed in our COVID vaccine coverage. Great progress has been made, yet there's significant and stark disparities in coverage. To understand these disparities, we need to be able to leverage big data, but at the community level. The challenges and bar barriers to vaccination are vastly different in rural communities compared to urban communities, 
and the root causes that contribute to these disparities could be different in one urban community, community compared to another. As big data advances, we need to ensure there is continued, sustained and equitable funding to enable technology, expertise and training for all communities. We continue to establish this data infrastructure in a way that pulls in a health equity framework and allows for the acquisition, use, sharing and dissemination of social determinants of health and place-based data. I look forward to hearing from the great group of speakers and experts here today and learning from and with you all. And I look forward to seeing the great progress and the impact from the efforts being led by the 3D Commission. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Leiden. Sorry, I, I could not, I could not unmute. Uh, hence, hence my delay in saying thank you. Um, uh, thank you for those opening remarks. Um, it's uh, now my great uh, pleasure to turn this over to uh, Dr. Jeff Sturcio, my uh, friend and colleague, also a 3D commissioner and uh, former chairman of Rabin Martin, which has served as the secretariat for the commission. Dr. Sturcio is going to introduce the panelists and guide us in a panel discussion. Jeff. Uh, thanks, Sandro, and thank you, Dr. Layden, for uh, for giving us such a good start to to this discussion. You know, as um, as Dr. Layden made clear, uh, she gave an example of how in Chicago they were able to use uh, data that was informed by an understanding of the social determinants of health to really match resources in addressing the COVID nineteen uh, pandemic in the Chicago area uh, to the responses that were needed, so that communities with the greatest burden of disease got the most resources and that was the most efficient way to really improve health of that population. Well, that particular example is something that we're now going to look at in a global perspective in the next hour with our, uh, our panelists. And, uh, you know, we, um, we always say at meetings like this that we have a very distinguished panel, that's true in this case. Uh, what I think is even, uh, more relevant to the discussion is we have a very diverse panel, uh, both in perspectives and in geographies, because we range uh, from, you know, just as I look around, uh, Sheila Tlu is in Southern Africa, uh, Tamu Davidson is in the Caribbean, Dr. Bulbul is in Bangladesh, Katie Dane uh, covers the globe with the NCD Alliance, but she's in Western Europe and so is Niels Lund. And Eric Gooseby is um, up very early in the morning uh, on the western coast of the United States. So, so we have a very diverse group, and their perspectives, I think, will be um, will be quite interesting. You know, what we want to do in the next hour is talk about, um, in concrete ways, how we need to plan consciously to adapt systems to reduce health disparities by looking carefully at the causes of the social determinants of health, both between and within countries, um, and then exploring how our panelists are thinking about taking the social determinants seriously, um, collating available data to really understand the impact of social determinants and uh, how, where, and how people live, learn, work, eat, and play uh, have an impact, a direct impact on their health conditions, and then how we can bring that all together to make the right kinds of investments to have a sustainable effect on improving population health. So um, I won't say more. I'd like to hear from our column, uh, excuse me, our panelists, but let me first introduce um, the panelists. Um, we have Dr. Uh, Mofajul Islam Bulbul, who's the Deputy Program Manager of the Directorate General of Health Services in the Ministry of Health and Family Welfare in Bangladesh. Uh, Katie Dane is the Chief Executive Officer of the NCD Alliance. Tamu Davidson is Head of the Chronic Disease and Injury Department at the Caribbean Public Health Agency. Uh, Eric Gooseby, who um, is a former UN Special Envoy on Tuberculosis. Um, uh, in his distinguished career, he's also led PEPFAR and been uh, the US Ambassador on Global Health Diplomacy. Uh, and he's been advising the Biden-Harris administration in the US on, uh, on the response to COVID-19. Nils Lund is the Vice President for Global Prevention and Health Promotion at Novo Nordisk. Uh, and last but certainly not least is Sheila Tlu, who's the co-chair of Nursing Now, the Nursing Now Global Campaign, the co-chair of the Global HIV Prevention Coalition, 
uh, and she's also uh, been a um, she's a has been a very effective advocate for HIV and AIDS uh, as the former regional director for UN AIDS, and uh, among her many other uh, um, roles, she was also health minister of Botswana in an in an earlier life. So. So I want to uh, welcome all of you, and I'm uh, really looking forward to this discussion. Um, let's start with uh, with Dr. Bulbul. Uh, you know, could you tell us uh, in Bangladesh how how have you and your colleagues in the ministry been thinking about social determinants, uh, both uh, in response to the COVID-19 pandemic, but also in your longer term work? Uh, and we'll come back to this um, later to take a look at some of the examples, but. But let's just start by saying, uh, to what degree does social determinants of health factor into your planning? Uh, thank you, uh, Chief, uh, uh, the moderator. Uh, at the outset, uh, I'd like to thank the Rockefeller Foundation and Boston University, the 3D Commission, for convening this uh, event uh, on investing for the future policies and programs to address the social determinants of health during this uh, difficult time when the humanity is facing a grave health crisis. Our thoughts and prayers, uh, prayers are with those who have lost their loved ones to COVID-19. Uh, actually, uh, today uh, we have a green picture before our eyes, devastated economy, overwhelmed health system, and huge loss of lives and so on. Uh, it is the fact that countries are disproportionately affected. So such event will uh, create an enormous impact uh, in the next global health arena. Uh, actually, uh, when we face, I mean, uh, the COVID situation, uh, we tried our best to man manage uh, according to uh, the uh, global guidance. Uh, we actually, uh, identified the national priorities uh, of the health and endorsed a preparedness uh, response plan, uh, which was built uh, with the whole of government approach. Uh, then uh, uh, we actually uh, revised and reallocated the funds according to the priorities uh, and our needs. Uh, we try to ensure uh, the proper utilizations of the funds implementation of the projects uh, uh, as well as our government has provided direct stimulus packages uh, in three areas. Government also uh, dispersed special allocation of funds to manage uh, COVID-19. These are all about COVID, but about the social determinants. Yes, uh, we are trying to integrate uh, the social determinants of health into our SDG agenda, as well as uh, uh, focusing on our universal health coverage. Uh, we try to uh, enhance the prioritization and coordination within the ministries uh, regarding the social determinants of health. Uh, we also have some regulatory assessment uh, uh, process using real-time monitoring system uh, to improve uh, the health within the ministry as well as we try to make uh, multi-sectoral coordination with other ministries to improve the overall health system in our country. Finally, uh, we try to use the technology. We try to use the modernized data infrastructure to support data sharing as well as using data-driven approach and generation of evidence to improve the overall uh, health conditions, especially the social determinants of health. Uh, thank you, Jeff. Uh, I will, uh, I mean, end here. Oh, well, thanks so much for getting us started. I think, you know, the, uh, the point you made about uh, multi-sectoral coordination, I think, is going to run through this conversation because, you know, by their very nature, the impact that social determinants um, have on the generation of health in a population are going to cut across different um, uh, different sectors. You know, uh, it's obvious, uh, for instance, we know that COVID-19, for instance, doesn't recognize political or geographic borders, nor does, uh, does a disease like COVID-19, for instance, 
uh, recognize the uh, distinction between uh, the transport finance industry and health ministries. Um, and, uh, and all of that um, you know, has to be taken into account in thinking about effective, um, effective responses. But let's stay with that, um, with that theme that you mentioned about uh, multi-sectoral coordination and data sharing. And let me turn to Katie. Um, you know, Katie, with the NCD Alliance, um, you've been very effective over the last few years in raising awareness and, uh, and prompting action uh, about um, the global epidemic of non-communicable diseases. Um, and, uh, and one of the ways that you've done that is by focusing people's attention on diabetes and heart disease and cancers and respiratory disease. Um, so how, do, how has your advocacy and the collaborations that you've had with various partners shifted now that you're facing challenges like a COVID pandemic that's global in scope and has seemed to have sucked up everybody's attention and resources, uh, and also uh, the social determinants that underlie most uh, much of the um, incidents of non-communicable diseases around the world that require the kind of multi-sectoral collaboration that Dr. Bulbul was talking about. So, so how you know? Just give us a report from the uh, from the front. Uh, how have things changed for the NCD Alliance over the last couple of years, and what ways have you found effective to bring people's attention to this nexus between uh, social determinants, the need for new kinds of data, and the needs for coordinated action to really affect NCDs uh, and the health of populations. Thanks very much, Jeff, and, and thanks to the organisers for, for bringing us together during the, the, the week of the, the World Health Assembly. Um, so in, in terms of, you know, what's changed in our advocacy efforts around financing, I mean, just to say at the beginning that financing, unsurprisingly, has been a, a major priority for us for, for over a decade now, and it's, it's obvious why, um, because NCDs remain kind of one of the, the least funded um, health issues out there. Um, but we've we've pivoted our work on financing in a number of ways over the last year because of COVID um, for, for a couple of reasons, obviously because of the clear links between NCDs and COVID. And that in a way, we're dealing with not just one pandemic, it's actually two. You've got COVID, the acute pandemic on top of a chronic pandemic NCDs that have been very much neglected for many, many, many years but also the collective failure to really tackle social determinants and underlying systemic causes of inequality, which has obviously left so many people vulnerable to, to shocks and, and pandemics as is happening today. So the way that we've really pivoted our um, advocacy work on financing is, is kind of three main points, really three main areas. Firstly, um, you know, it's, it's very clear that the way that financing for health is determined is based upon definitions and on metrics you know I think Dr, Dr. Margaret Chan of, of WHO famously said what gets measured gets done um, and so the first point that we've come to is that we actually need to revisit how we define and measure health security and pandemic preparedness because it's very very clear that um, and, until now NCDs were very much not part of the conversation around how we actually measure um, progress around health security um, you know, the underlying NCD burden of many countries wasn't even included in those conversations. Um, and so things like the Health Security Index obviously kind of turned out to be very wrong in terms of putting the US and the UK as kind of two countries which were particularly well prepared. And, and obviously we know that that's, that's not turned out to be the case. So um, the first point of kind of pivot in our advocacy connected to financing is to really revisit the metrics for health security to ensure that we actually have things like social determinants, population health and prevention kind of part of the health security definition. And that's obviously very relevant this week during the World Health Assembly when there are discussions going on about a WHO treaty on pandemic preparedness that are being discussed and probably will continue into November of, of this year um, with a dedicated session. Um, the second way that we've pivoted uh, our advocate work of financing is, is very much to really centre on prevention. I think, you know, COVID has very clearly exposed the damage that neglecting um, public spending on health, particularly in terms of prevention, has done over many years in many countries. Um, but on the other hand, it's also taught us that the costs of investing in prevention and early response are absolutely minuscule compared to the costs of paying for the consequences of underinvestment. 
So we know to date that COVID has claimed the lives of more than 3.5 million people and could cost the global economy around $10 trillion um, for 2020 and 2021, whilst the estimated cost of preparedness is only in the tens of billions, um, according to, to different ways of, of modeling those sorts of figures. So our message has been very clearly that you know governments need to get a grip on the prevention the upstream determinants of, of ncds um but i think it's very it's, it's important to kind of highlight that this is you know it's going to take a while to really shift this because if you actually look at the status quo um expenditure on prevention has historically been very very low just look at oecd countries 2.8 percent of domestic health spending in oecd countries goes towards prevention so we've got a very low bar that we need to be increasing. And then the third kind of pivot that we've done around advocacy on funding as it relates to COVID is the point around integration. Um, obviously, you know, significant funding is, is going into COVID-19 responses um, globally and at the national level. Um, and I think it would be a huge missed opportunity if those COVID funds aren't used for broader kind of health system strengthening and, and health for all, rather than creating a new silo, which is COVID specific. Um, and so in a way we're talking about a kind of COVID plus response. We're talking about, you know, using the global COVID vaccination program, for instance, to, to ensure that we're seeing, um, you know, for example, uh, early screening of um, hypertension, uh, actually making the most of um, the population contact opportunity to um, improve data collection and records so that we're actually using the kind of COVID response um, to improve health more broadly um, so that we can obviously avoid, um, you know, we can be better prepared for, for future pandemics um, in the future. Yeah, thanks, Katie. And, you know, you, <clears throat> your last comment in particular just reminds us that one of the lessons I think we've learned from the past uh, 16 months of, of living with this pandemic and, and uh, in some cases observing in the cases of many of you actually rolling your sleeves up and getting involved in the global response is that uh, it actually brings us back to basics. Uh, you know, as, as you said, uh, Katie, it's, um, you know, you have to define what is it you're trying to measure and what impact will it have if you have good measures of, of that. Um, integrating um, responses across the health system so that you actually have a resilient system uh, that works when crises come up, but it also works in between the crises to provide uh, good health care to people. Uh, and prevention, um, you know, it's, I mean, it reminds us all of the, uh, the cliche that an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure, and we found that reinforced um, over and over again. So it isn't as if, uh, and, and I'm sure that uh, at the World Health Assembly this week, many will be trying to think of new solutions, but it isn't as if we need new solutions. We just need to put into practice uh, the tried and true solutions that we have to a certain degree. Now, let me uh, turn to Tamu Davidson next, and let's move from uh, the, the global, which Katie has just been talking about, uh, to, uh, to the Caribbean. And you know, I, I should have mentioned that you had, uh, before you went to CARFA, you were at the Ministry of Health and Wellness in Jamaica. So you've had experience both at the country and regional level in uh, trying to improve uh, investments in the social determinants of health and to address NCDs in both Jamaica and in, in the region. So uh, just tell us how, um, you know, what have you learned? What are some examples of how you've been able to put data to use in addressing the underlying social determinants uh, to improve response uh, to health uh, conditions that are plaguing the populations in your countries. Okay, thank you for the organizers for inviting the Caribbean Public Health Agency to be a part of this. Um, certainly social determinants of health are very important in the Caribbean context. So I'd like to just share some of my, my experiences with the NCD investment case, particularly in, in the Jamaican setting. So prior to this, um, most of our economic studies had been around macroeconomic type studies, which looked at the cost of GDP. Additionally, um, most of our studies had not drilled down to look at what are these, what will it cost to put in some of these interventions around NCDs? 
And it's well established that NCDs are a major public health issue for the Caribbean. There, it's also well established that there are a set of cost-effective interventions that countries have been asked to implement in order to achieve this reduction in NCDs. But what did it mean for a country like Jamaica to implement those interventions? What would it cost? Um, what was the benefit to um, implementing those interventions? And how can, could countries such as Jamaica prioritize implementing these types of interventions? So the economic um, investment case uh, for NCDs and also mental health looked at the direct benefits of putting um, prioritized interventions, specifically the WHO um, best buys at a country level, what that would cost. So with this study, we're able to prioritize um, what these policy interventions would be. So for example, the study looked at what are some of the policies with respect to tobacco, alcohol, um, the treatment of diabetes and cardiovascular disease. And over a five or 15 year um, period, what would be the return on investment if we decided to move, implement these, these policies? So it would help a country to prioritize out of all of these interventions, which ones in, in your particular context, um, and this was the case for both Jamaica, for Barbados, what in your particular context should you um, prioritize in terms of implementing in, in addressing NCDs? And what was the cost to that? The study goes further to, um, in fact, recommend what would, how would that contribute towards your economic growth agenda? So it also took an institutional context. So this data would assist not only the Ministry of Health, but also other sectors in helping to prioritize um, what specific interventions you needed to implement. So we didn't have this body of evidence before. Most of it was around costs that were estimated from a global level, but this allowed you as a Ministry of Health, as a minister to take this information and now look at your national context to make the argument for these key policies. So, so this was one of the key strategies that, you know, helped to really prioritize that policy agenda within the NCD agenda mm -hmm. and to make those best by um, interventions operational at a national level. Yeah, no, and, that, and that's a terrific example because, I mean, in a sense, what you were doing was learning to speak the language of the finance ministry and other ministers and to interpret the health issues that were um, that were actually weighing on the the economy in a way that would get them to see that this was really something that they needed to be concerned about so it's it's an underlying aspect of what uh what katie and um and dr bobol and and we'll hear from others as well have been talking about because if health just exists in a silo, it's hard to get the integration across the government that you need to actually um, affect policies or implement policies that will affect changes that will improve health outcomes and that in, in, um, in turn will improve economic outcomes. So I think it's a really important point and it's one we'll come back to again. In fact, um, let me turn to, uh, to Eric Goosby next and Eric, I wondered, um, you know, in your case, there's so many things that uh, you've been engaged in. I, I want to just pick up on a, a, a recent uh, area of your activity in, in addressing uh, the COVID-19 response um, through the U.S. Um, Coronavirus Task Force. And how have, um, how has that group begun to think about um, social determinants in, res in relation to the COVID response? You know, has it been, uh, have you seen the kind of um, application of the insights that, for instance, Katie was talking about in terms of integration, uh, or Dr. Davidson was talking about with respect to putting together um, a way of looking at benefits and costs that gives a broader um, resonance uh, to people from different disciplinary backgrounds? 
you know, just talk to us a little bit about how you've been looking at this nexus between data and determinants uh, in helping make the decisions that have to be made uh, to drive the response across the entire country. Well, thank you. Um, thank you to the Rockefeller Foundation, uh, BU School of Public Health, uh, and to the Raven uh, Group with Jeff's Dr. Sturcio's uh, orchestration. It's it's been a wonderful uh, challenge. The entire discussion over the last year and a half or so, um, trying to understand those connections that Jeff just articulated. Um, I think. Um, it has been a challenge, even with the challenge that COVID presented to all the governments and civil society on the planet at one time, even with that crescendo of uh, response demanded by the morbidity and mortality presented, our ability to understand and pivot into data-driven responses still took time. And I think um, really is a uh, example of an urgent, emergent, emergency level demand uh, butting up against uh, all the bureaucracies that need to understand and be mobilized to create the response. Um, the United States uh, spent a lot of time uh, trying to understand uh, on multiple levels, as all governments and um, civil societies did, uh, where the virus was, how it moved through both individuals, and what were the clinical manifestations of, of that movement, uh, and at the same time had to understand how the virus was moving through populations in different uh, settings with different surveillance capabilities, different eyes and ears, and in the United States, you have all of these jurisdictions that converge in any given geography, uh, all of which are connected to different budgets to create uh, and support responses. And putting that matrix of, uh, of data in real time, we understand it on Monday, but we don't understand uh, all the neighborhoods in, in an area. We understand one neighborhood in an area. Uh, how do you pivot activity in terms of allocation decisions with programmatic decisions following that uh, that create different outcomes to align your surveillance system with that so you're getting that feedback to alter your decision to put it more on point uh, was the biggest struggle uh, for, for many of our uh, kind of jurisdictions as they shuffled into uh, trying to coordinate one response. Uh, I think that um, the data collection, without it, none of that would have occurred, so that is critical. But the analysis, as uh, I think Katie alluded to, the data without analysis is useless, and the time frame of COVID uh, created a challenge that none of us had seen in, uh, in trying to develop systems that were nimble and responsive enough to take advantage of the data that we already have collected, had not analyzed nor put into a policy uh, decision uh, change as to how that information changes it. The other challenge that I think was ubiquitous was the uh, struggle around uh, that unequal playing field as you look at specific populations in a given geography. Uh, lending itself to uh, a, a spectrum of different needs that the city uh, had to respond to to, uh, to address them. And the, um, the uh, uh, understanding of how prior uh, comorbidities, how uh, access and retention in medical delivery systems gave us opportunities to interface more rapidly with populations, but they were all still very difficult to activate uh, and to integrate into the COVID response. So I think that all of those um, uh, uh, issues really speak to uh, the social determinants of health being difficult to bring in to decision-making decisions, but I think COVID made many people in the public health sector see uh, the importance 
of uh, the understanding those synergies and those uh, interactions more uh, in detail by population and deeply informed uh, the final decisions around allocation on testing, but especially vaccination uh, distribution. Oh, thanks, Eric. And I, I think you've put in a, in a very um, eloquent way uh, just how complex this um, uh, decision making is in trying to deal with broad public health um, uh, questions like uh, how do we respond to the COVID pandemic. Um, and I, I like the way you put it about um, uh, the unequal playing field among different populations uh, and the need to really um, activate, motivate, integrate um, the responses at the community level into the overall response. Um, I think that's another theme that's important for us uh, to consider. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, I'd like to now in, in just turning to our last two panelists, uh, we could pick up on, on that point um, in both uh, what uh, Nils can talk to us about with respect to cities changing diabetes, and then Sheila and her, um, her work in many areas in Africa and elsewhere around the world. Uh, but let's start with Nils Lund um, from Novo Nordisk. And uh, Nils, um, you know, the, I'm really intrigued by the way that, um, that Eric just put this, uh, this point about the need to activate, motivate, and integrate uh, the work of communities into a broad response um, to uh, a health challenge like COVID-19 or uh, like diabetes, you know, to come back to what Katie was saying about the NCD pandemic uh, or epidemics, uh, because they are epidemics in the plural. Uh, but you've been working with uh, your colleagues at Novo and your partners in a number of cities around the world on cities changing diabetes for the past several years. Um, how have you addressed um, that perspective that we've just heard from Dr. Gooseby uh, in the work that you're doing in, in cities changing diabetes? Well, well I think, uh, well, first, thanks for the invitation and for the opportunity to share our experiences. Uh, I think uh, in cities changing diabetes, is, uh, it, it, the power of community and of the local coalition has probably been you know, maybe both the biggest surprise, but also the, the strongest uh, contribution to the improvement of, of health uh, in the uh, now 37 cities that we collaborate with uh, around the world. Um, Cities Changing Diabetes was initiated back in 2014 as a public-private partnership uh, platform to address uh, specifically the social and cultural determinants of health related to diabetes in urban settings. So, you know, as such, and also from a methodological perspective, the social determinants of health perspectives was embedded in the program from the beginning. Uh, and uh, we developed research methodologies, uh, some called vulnerability assessment and the diabetes priority assessment and, and applied them in a number of cities around the world. We took the same approach uh, everywhere, but ev all uh, research was local and, and therefore also contextual. Uh, and uh, the, this research revealed a, a, a new social and cultural risk factors, in addition to the factors that such as income, housing, education, employment that we would normally know. But we found, for example, uh, the following three, uh, social isolation is, a, is an important risk, risk factor. And now I talk about diabetes, but it's certainly for NCDs in general. Mistrust in formal health uh, institution is also one, and, and time poverty the fact that uh, the lack of uh, time resources is an impediment to re reducing healthy meals, exercise, and so on, which is further uh, gendered uh, in, in the way that uh, many um, caregivers and, uh, and keepers of household are, are also women. Uh, cities in diabetes is uh, now active, as I said, in 37 cities around the world uh, in, on five continents. And uh, we are moving increasingly to the focus on prevention uh, with uh, priorities, particularly on community engagement, supporting uh, organi local organizations to collaborate and address the health challenges in their community. Uh, this includes uh, uh, some of the more socially deprived areas of Copenhagen, but also uh, many other places uh, in, uh, around the world, uh, Philadelphia, Houston, uh, as examples. We also work to address uh, food systems, uh, finding solutions to establishing sustainable food systems for the most vulnerable, 
Again, this has, is, a, has, is a risk factor for diabetes, but certainly also uh, all uh, other uh, types of uh, chronic disease. We look at healthy urban planning, and we have worked with the C40 climate mayors uh, over the past five years to map the co-benefits of climate and, and, and health uh, investments. And we also work to uh, improve the interface uh, between the community uh, and, and the health system, for example, by improving uh, health literacy and going new ways, uh, for example, work, working with faith-based communities to, to see how we can reduce this risk. If we look at, the, at COVID-19 and, and the program that we, uh, that we have been, been uh, working on, uh, I would say a year and two months ago, I was, you know, I didn't really know, but, uh, you know, what I was going to think about it. But I think we have seen uh, as data emerged that the COVID-19 has become a magnifying glass for health inequalities. Um, and as it has the greatest uh, impact on the lives of people living in deprivation or facing uh, difficult socioeconomic circumstances. And, and so the prevalence and the severity of COVID-19 is magnified by pre-existing conditions, which uh, themselves are socially determined. Uh, so the combination of diabetes, obesity, and COVID-19 is, is, is actually the perfect storm for public health. And if there was ever a time when we ask for health in all policies was relevant. I think this is probably the time. And, and we, th we saw to, to X point that, you know, even if we had local coalitions uh, and of community groups and academia and so on, you know, they, uh, if, if, if their task was uh, initially on, on diabetes and the prevention of diabetes, we saw, you know, in this situation, uh, them, uh, you know, they knew each other and, and there was a, a glue between the, uh, individuals and the organizations already and saw them working to respond to a new challenge and and also applying some of the same met methodologies uh, uh, to uh, COVID that they had done uh, for diabetes. And they, an example from Houston is the principal investigator uh, of the uh, of, uh, of the research uh, uh, took a novel approach by using insights on the social determinants of health and risk of diabetes in, in Houston. Um, to predict which parts of major metropolitan centers in uh, Texas would be expected to have the largest pressure from COVID-19 by combining those risk factors here. So there's a, you know, a great uh, lesson here to, you know, if you are creative with the data and use the available resources and also understand the link between infectious and, and, uh, and, uh, and in chronic disease, particularly for them uh, in the field of social determinants of health, you can really uh, move forward and, and, and break new ground and maybe also have an early response uh, than you would otherwise have had. Well, that, uh, that's a fascinating uh, example, Nils, of, of exactly how to do what we've been talking about throughout this conversation, which is to use data in new ways uh, to understand how the social determinants of health are creating either risk factors that we see in uh, how diseases show up in the population uh, or can predict where we should intervene in, in particular groups who are likely to be more vulnerable than, than others as a result. So that's a, a great example of the end result of the kind of analysis that we've been advocating for. Um, and the, uh, how you describe the way that you're looking at these issues in uh, with your partners in 37 cities uh, is also really exciting because, uh, you know, as you said, um, to go back to the question of uh, using COVID-19 as a lens of understanding what needs to be done to improve health system performance, um, it just magnified pre-existing conditions that are socially determined, as, as you said. So um, that's a, a good question um, uh, to, uh, for us to now uh, turn to Sheila Tlu. But Sheila, before I ask you to intervene, I just wanted to remind the rest of the audience uh, that we will be having some time for questions from the floor. If you have questions, please just put them in the chat box and we'll, uh, we'll collect them and, um, uh, and, uh, and introduce those into the conversation. Uh, there's already a question about uh, data sources, which I'll, I'll raise yes. um, uh, when we get to that point. But Sheila, um, you know, you've been waiting patiently uh, we've talked about uh, the importance of multi-sectoral coordination, of uh, speaking the language of policymakers, of finding ways to even the uneven playing field we have and in intervening in certain populations. 
uh, and the power of communities and local coalitions. So um, what's your view on how we should be advising countries on really addressing uh, the underlying social determinants of health uh, that are giving us such um, problems in, um, in bringing interventions to everybody who needs them? So over to you. Yeah, thank you very much. And let me greet uh, the, the participants and, and just say how exciting it is for me to be part of this uh, Rockefeller 3D Commission. We are doing quite a lot and I'm learning quite a lot from it. But I also want to pay my regards to Dr. Jennifer Layden because I'm a child of Chicago. And to say that I can't wait for COVID to be over so I can visit Chicago because that's where I got my PhD and that's where I got really uh, schooled on gender issues. So Jeff, to answer your question, let me say for me in Botswana, there were two, two events. I was coming from an academic environment. You know, when I became a minister, I was coming from an academic environment as a professor of nursing, but then also a civil society environment, having founded the Society for Women and AIDS in Africa, but also having worked with, uh, you know, multisectorally with other women's organizations, you know, in all the sectors. For example, when we are going to Beijing, we, we, we were able to work together in fielding the Botswana position when it comes to, when it comes to women's health, uh, you know, the, the, the violence against women, looking also at the law. And we were able to work together to change the laws because we knew that if you change one law, it has an impact on not just health, but also on social and uh, well being for women. So, uh, but the, the lucky part was I also was in a country that believed in the power of data in order to have evidence informed decisions. Um, we, the Botswana used a lot of civil society data in order to make decisions because they really believe that you, you know, with civil society, they know they live the experiences of, of, of the communities that they're in. So that the, the, the gist of it was simply to ensure that when you had, you know, had done any research, in order for it to be properly implemented, we made sure that when we had workshops, we would invite you know, all ministries, especially the ministries of finance, local government, gender, um, and, you know, and even the rural development so that they understand their role in supporting population health. So that was very important. For example, when I did research with um, the University of Oslo on the elderly, in disseminating that research, we had a workshop. We invited all the ministries concerned and they used that data to therefore come up with policies for the elderly. You know, I did that as a, from, this, from civil society, but we then had a policy on the elderly that involved the, you know, they are getting the, 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 the social needs and ensuring that they, they, they are well catered for. So that, that was a given. And so when I became minister, therefore, all I needed was to then say, how do I ensure that I keep on getting data from civil society in order to make informed decisions? So I started a form of social contracting which is, which is really a form of innovative funding um, of civil society organizations as people who live the experiences of communities and could therefore have equitable uh, you know, solutions on any uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, issues that affected uh, population health. So, and that, that worked very well, but as UNA's regional director, I came in with that knowledge that not every country is configured like Botswana. And indeed there were countries where civil society is not, you know, part, uh, the, the countries that don't work well with civil society. But I knew that health is a political choice. So for HIV and TB plus other issues, we then would provide decision makers with a framework of data about their country situations so that they could make informed decisions. For example, HIV investment cases, and, and also situation rooms where they could have real time data on the, 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 the HIV situation in their countries. So it worked in some countries, in others, it, it, it didn't work that well, but definitely in countries where it worked and there was engagement 
cross-culturally, we saw change, but not only that, sustainable change. So I could go on with a, you know, uh, you know, a, an example of how we ended child marriages in Malawi because we knew that this affects the women's ability to negotiate safer sex or to refuse unsafe sex. It also, you know, uh, impoverished young, young girls. And, you know, we, it was a whole process going through that, but engagement of the chiefs in that change ensured sustainability. And right now, Malawi has long stopped child, early child marriages and uh, because the chiefs were involved. So it's really that, yeah, thank you. Well, thank you, Sheila. I, um, I think that you've raised another couple of uh, really interesting points. Um, and uh, one that uh, others have also spoken about though is the power of data uh, to really uh, provide a basis for different kinds of decisions and more inclusive decisions. So I, I think that's an important element to, to add to our mix. And also, I, um, I just want to reiterate what you said about health is a political choice. And, uh, and actually, this, raises, this gets us to the next question I wanted to pose to all of the panelists. Um, and, uh, you know, and Dr. Layden, feel free to, to jump in here as well. But, you know, we've talked about a number of components of how um, uh, the how of putting, bringing together data decision making, uh, excuse me, data and, and social determinants to lead to better decision making. One of the things that uh, several of you have alluded to um, is how can you get um, officials and people with interests in different parts of, of, uh, of society to work together on improving population health? So for instance, uh, you know, in urban settings, how do you get the transportation commissioner to worry about whether people have, uh, have ready access through public transit to get to hospitals or health centers? Um, you know, uh, in the cities that Nils has been uh, been working in, how do different parts of the city administration work together to uh, help make sure that people have access to, uh, that there aren't food deserts, for instance? That's another example. And Sheila, you mentioned uh, that, uh, you know, when you were implementing decisions in Botswana, you would get all the ministries together to understand their role in helping to make this health decision successful. So I wonder if, if uh, you know, it's just, uh, let's open this up to all of you, uh, some examples of how you're able to bring together ministers and interest groups outside the health sector uh, to help ensure that investments in social determinants are actually successful in improving population health, that, that there is the integration you need, that people work together across sectors. I'd just be interested, and I think the audience would too, in hearing examples of where you've been able to make that happen. Eric, why don't we start with you? Thank you. That's a great. That's a great question. Um, I think that the um, the challenge uh, that COVID afforded leadership in whatever municipality, uh, provincial, national, federal, state you want to carve out. Um, each of the, uh, the, the COVID challenge presented a, uh, an, um, an unequal um, uh, presentation of people with different needs to the delivery system. And the delivery system had to accept those differences from different neighborhoods, different populations, different individuals. As we understood that better, we began to see comorbidities uh, teased out as affording a different threat from a COVID exposure and infection, and uh, were able to rapidly incorporate those differences into how we looked for people uh, and how we prioritized high risk and people we wanted to have differential or more um, uh, managed access. We wanted a preferred access conduit to be created. Those disparities enabled those conversations with civil society leadership to be concrete and real. Uh, faith leaders in particular, uh, people that were social organizers around political agendas in, specific, in and with specific communities, uh, given the COVID data were, um, uh, uh, were um, 
uh, pushed into not ignoring it, but uh, rapidly incorporated it in, into their argument for why these services were uh, needed in their population because of this disproportionate response in infec infection and in uh, morbidity once infected. So uh, I think it was catalytic to see the opportunity to use that as the reason for the conversation. It galvanized the, their response. <clears throat> Yeah. Um, no, thanks, Eric. Uh, Dr. Bubul, is, uh, let's turn to you next. Uh, thank you very much. And I think uh, this is a, a really, uh, we have assumed that COVID-19 actually opened our eyes. Uh, a very, uh, uh, I mean, first time I, I say uh, that uh, many of the countries have started to work with whole of government approach because uh, this is really uh, was challenge for one ministry to handle the situation. So if you consider about uh, not only the communicable disease, but also the non-communicable disease, as Nils uh, mentioned earlier, so we must have to include everyone uh, into uh, our field of battle. I mean, uh, otherwise we can't be uh, a succeed. Uh, second point is, uh, as mentioned by Eric, uh, that is political agenda. You know that uh, many of the countries, like in Bangladesh, we are implementing the five years uh, plan. So during this five years plan, we try to uh, bring together all the stakeholders uh, to uh, prepare the document as well as uh, we distribute the task uh, of each ministry. So. This might be one of the way to be successful uh, to implement our programs uh, to improve the health situation in the country. But there are challenges as well, uh, because you know that uh, when you say about collaboration on, or coordination, there is always challenges, but uh, the leadership is very much important, the political leadership. So our honorable prime minister has that kinds of leadership and she actually uh, uh, taken the role uh, to improve the situation. So that might be one way to improve the country's scenario of health. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you. And uh, next uh, it's uh, Katie and then Nils. Thanks, Jeff. And I think I'll just build upon Bulbul's point. Um, I, I mean, I think one thing that we've learned over the years is that, you know, if you're actually, you know, to see a, a true kind of whole of government response on a, health issue, as, as Bobo just highlighted, I think it's so important that you've got heads of government, heads of state leadership on the issue, because we all know that ministries of health are critical, but they don't necessarily have a huge amount of political clout across the whole of government. So if you've got health very much kind of as a priority for the prime minister or president, that makes a, a huge difference to start with. I think the second thing that we've learned over the years in this regard is, you know, how do you get, you know, NCDs or health on the top of environment um, uh, ministry or transport or trade or finance is is to really talk their language um, and I think one of the experiences that no doubt Tamu could say more of is actually the process of developing these investment cases on NCDs at the country level it, it, the process is actually as important as the outcome because actually it gives an opportunity to talk to different parts of the government about you know, the, the impact of NCDs on their different portfolio, their priorities, the, the fact that it's actually a, an investment to be working on NCDs rather than a cost, and to really actually increase awareness and understanding of what we're actually talking about from a, a health perspective. Um, and then I'd also say that one of the, the lessons that we've learned in this area is that um, you need to focus on the kind of co-benefit solutions. Um, obviously, you know, the Minister of Environment is focused on environment and they have certain you know targets and indicators that they're working towards if we can actually be presenting you know from an ncd in a public health perspective what are the actual kind of you know co-benefit solutions that both impact on health as well as the environment in that case it, it goes a long way in actually kind of building the the arguments and the, the commitment towards making a change so for example in the environment you know we've done a lot of advocacy work on the importance of clean energy sources active transport sustainable food systems and these are things that both impact health and population health as well as our, our win-win solutions for the environment ministry so really trying to kind of focus on the co-benefit solutions i think 
Yeah, that's an important point. Uh, Nils and then uh, Tamu. Thanks, I, I really share uh, the, uh, Katie's observation about the health ministers or um, mayors, health mayors, you know, not necessarily being at the top of the political hierarchy. And, and, I, and I think our experience is that the programs have probably worked the best when, when there's been ownership from the top, uh, at least initially, and you know, to, to, to guide here. Um, what I think, though, also is that um, I think uh, spending time uh, to create a joint understanding of what the problem is uh, and what should be addressed is really, really important. So there's a there's a process aspect uh, of this uh, where data and uh, data analysis can play a really, really important role. Uh, it's part of the program that I'm I've been been running. We have de deliberately decided not to come in with any data from the beginning and say this is the pro this is your problem. What are you going to do about it? Rather, we have we have said we think there the, the might be a challenge. We want to understand that a little bit better. Uh, done the research and actually used local research, data collection, and analysis as a trust building mechanism uh, to uh, to you know both bring people from various uh, research uh, fields uh, together, but also to bring in civil society organizations together and be part of both the data collection, but uh, just as much as as the uh, as the analysis of that uh, to develop you know what would be what are the hypotheses we would like to address. So I think there's, you know, to, to the point of, of what you're doing in the 3D Commission, I think there's a very strong message or at least experience from our point of view that, you know, data data collection and uh, data analysis and hypothesis generation is actually a, a trust building mechanism that you know, certainly can in, in itself uh, help uh, people to, to gather around a, a, a joint purpose. No, that's a really important point. Um, then uh, we, uh, uh, Tom who's next and then Sheila, and then I'd like to turn to some questions from the audience. Tom. Yes, just to build on some of the discussion here, I think one of the major ingredients is to have the highest um, political commitment at the heads of government. And that's something that we had in the Caribbean setting from 2007 with the Port of Spain declaration on NCDs. We also had a commitment from the ministries, ministers sorry, of agriculture around NCDs that same year to create a healthy environment. Um, the second thing um, approach is to using this economic investment data, building that case, we had to work with, uh, in a multi-sectoral setting, working with civil society, meeting with private sector, meeting with different government agencies to make the case, to understand it from their perspective and to package the information in a way that um, resonated with that group. The third thing I'd like to highlight is the need to build a champion within each sector. So one of the lessons we learned from tobacco control was that we, when we went to meet with these different sectors, we are actually building on some of the work we did around the multi-sectoral approach with respect to tobacco, which is truly uh, needs you to deal with tax, needs to, you to deal with the uh, private sector, civil society. And then there's also the bottom up across approach using working with civil society. We have a very strong and active civil society group um, within the Caribbean. We have the Healthy Caribbean Coalition and also strong groups within countries. And they worked with um, different groupings, different um, sectors to also help to raise awareness about NCDs and the impact on their particular sector. So important to build champions within each sector, which we're able to do with tobacco and build on that experience. And then with the COVID-19 response, again, this, we have a lot of lessons learned from there to help to support us moving forward. In, in dressing the social determinants of health. But it has to be a bottom-up approach, a cross approach, so building community awareness about the, the NCDs, um, about the social determinants of health, but also a top-down and a cross approach working with different sectors. And in general, I, um, there is a policy shift as well, or important policy approach that is taken within the Caribbean setting is this health in all policies approach. So when um, health policies or any policies being debated 
um, different sectors uh, within government and outside of government are, are part of that debate and process. So there's also that opportunity to really impact on the broad agenda and to make the argument, um, health argument with respect to some of these policies. So these are just some of the things that I, I want to highlight. Okay. Yeah, thank you, uh, Tamu. I, I just want to offer one gloss on what you said. Um, you know, I think in my experience, um, putting together uh, multi-sectoral coalitions really can lead to uh, amazing results. And I think we've all, you know, many of you have given examples of that. The other thing that you just alluded to that I wanted to point out is that when you get people together in a coalition to work on problem A, you know, they'll be happy to work together on problem B and problem C because they build a sense of trust and accomplishment by successfully working on problem A. And that's something that I think we've seen in the last year or so that, uh, you know, certainly, um, uh, you know, uh, HIV activists I know turned to COVID-19 and began to work on that in the same way, uh, just as one example. And I, I think that's another uh, interesting aspect of that kind of coalition building. And then Sheila, you have the last word on, on this subject. Yes, uh, thank you very much. We, we, you know, for COVID-19, I must say that uh, a lot of countries, especially the ones in Africa, they got caught by surprise. So it, it was interesting that for some of them, it was more like, okay, what countries, will, you know, this country is locking down, we're also going to lock down without really looking at the structures and integrating what data and what kind of lockdown they want to do. But for those who are able to listen to people like us who have been in the, you know, in the HIV field, it was ready to say, let's put money where the communities are for sustainable positive response. So I'm trying to follow up on what Anise was, was talking about when he talked about civil society organizations. Now in all countries, the structures are there, you know, in the form of HIV AIDS activists. And it was really to say to countries, let's use these activists, you know, that they're in every locality, in every village, you know, in every city, you know, strengthen and, and let's make sure that they are able to engage for IEC, for information, for education, for communication. They are the pros. They have gone through, you know, talking about a very sensitive topic of sex. And therefore something like COVID, they can be able to come up with really useful messages that would be relevant to communities. Some countries didn't do that. So you, you find that as a result, there was no relevance. And you know, even for lockdown, people are saying, it's lockdown for who, not for us. So yet if they had been engaged, it would have been great for, for information, education, communication, but also for good advice on how to do effective lockdowns that would make you know, sense at community level. And also to look at if you are looking down, let's look at the whole COVID thing. Is there enough water in our village? Do we have access to water, to sanitation, to hygiene? How do we therefore ensure that we have lockdown, but also we have the preventive measures? A lot of countries didn't look into that. But those that did, we then saw where villages were starting to be supplied with water, where suddenly, where there had been no money. You know, politicians will always say there is no money, but suddenly there was money to dig wells, to supply communities with water. And therefore it all got well for the, for, you know, for the COVID response. So that is really to say, you know, engagement of communities and ensuring that community healthcare workers are there to work with communities as you know, has really or has worked before and it will actually work for the COVID response. Thanks. Thanks, Sheila. That's that's really a very powerful point, and I, I think we would all agree with that. Um, let's we have um, some time now. I'd like to turn to a couple of questions from the audience, uh, and there are uh, there are two. Um, let's start with first. There was a question about um, what do we mean? We've many of us have been talking about um, big data and the the need to deploy big data uh, together with an understanding of social determinants to try to improve population health outcomes. Um, but the question around big data was, what do we mean by big data? Where are the data going to come from? Uh, how is it curated or how are they curated? Um, are we talking about social media data? Um, who would like to uh, make a few uh, comments on that question?
I think what, um, I mean, one aspect of it uh, is that uh, uh, Sheila and Niels and, and a couple of others have, and uh, Eric made the point that this isn't a question of where um, epidemiologists fly in and just inundate people with their data, uh, you know, the kinds of data that epidemiologists use to make decisions. But often what we need to do is um, work with the community to understand the problems they're facing and how you can actually measure that. Katie also made this point about redefining what we mean by metrics. Um, so there are two aspects of, of this. One is what are the questions we're trying to answer and what data do you need and where do you find it? Uh, and then also, um, you know, how do you collate, curate, and deploy different sorts of data? But, but you know, are, is this something where um, there's a handbook you can turn to and you start on page one and it tells you exactly what data to collect? Um, or is it more complicated? I'm, I'm just trying to... Um, dig out what this question was all about. Um, so uh, Jennifer and then Niels had, uh, had comments. Sure, um, I'll just have a couple comments um, and interested to hear others' perspectives on it. And I think it's, it's a challenge we're all facing to identify the potential uh, sources of data and not only what those uh, sources are, but then how to use them in a way that doesn't um, introduce any biases and we understand what the data can tell us. Um, some, you know, uh, more tra uh, less traditional data sets we've looked at is when you can get measures, not just of individual level um, disease outcomes and in, in disease individual level, but more at the community level. So uh, transportation data, um, environmental data, things that help to describe the community, often those are um, publicly available data sets, and it's, it's a matter of identifying what they are, what they represent, and understanding the limitations of that data. Uh, one of the tricks sometimes tends to be in, in understanding how to incorporate that and blend it with the individual level data to help um, describe um, uh, the associations. Um, and then there's, I think, also the use uh, of other metrics that people develop. Um, there's been recently the use of social vulnerability indexes that try to combine multiple uh, data sources or types of data about um, the, the community level indicators like um, housing, age distribution to kind of assess or describe the risk or vulnerability of a population. So it's, uh, I think, a combination of pulling in data from less traditional sources as well as developing metrics that help to um, identify um, some vulnerabilities or describe the vulnerabilities at the population level. I, and I think, um, I think the point you made about it's important to learn how to incorporate and blend different sources of data together to lead to, uh, you know, to important insights that can then be Im employed in addressing these questions in the, uh, in the real world is, is critical. Niels. Yes, I, you know, my reflection is that uh, over the seven, eight years we've been working with this, that you, we come also from a situation where health departments and uh, also, you know, within my own uh, organization, we, there was a great reliance on biomedical data and it's only half the picture or, you know, what is above this, the surface of the iceberg. And, and I think uh, we have progressed significantly over the past uh, years, and particularly probably within the last uh, 12 to 18 months in terms of understanding the importance uh, of, uh, of the uh, social factors and, and, uh, and the way that they determine their health. Uh, and I also see uh, you know, a lot of experimentation in, in, in blending uh, quantitative and qualitative data. Um, and we have a number of examples from our own co collaboration. One of the things that I think it's, it's really interesting these days is uh, that we are seeing in, in, in one city that is looking at this is, is analyzing uh, social media data or social listening and, and using you know, that vast uh, amount of data. Um, in this case, it's uh, the diabetes discussion boards um, to understand you know, what are people talking about uh, and, and how might that influence uh, their policy and, and outreach. Um, uh, and we, we are to see what, what, what will come out of that and, and certainly also what the uh, local health response will, will be of that. One of the challenges, I think, is, is the, uh, as I said, 37 cities and they are probably in 20 different countries and we cannot share anything across. It's, uh, we, we, we gave up on that from the beginning simply because of uh, 
that you know the data protocols uh, and and cross national collaboration is is something you do when you invest in a in a big clinical trial for the study of the drug. But in this case, it's really really complicated, and and we just uh, you know shied away from it. And then so in some sense, some of of the learnings across are, are, are more, you know, it's a more of a handheld analysis and, and to some extent also anecdotal. Uh, and, I, and I don't know how to address that, but uh, it's just complicated. Yeah, you know, on that, on that last point, it's interesting, uh, you know, clinical trials have about an 80 year history. So it's, it's over decades that the protocols for sharing clinical trial data and ensuring that they're comparable and, you know, all the things that we do now in, in clinical trials. Uh, so it's not too surprising that the kind of work that all of you are doing now on linking data and social determinants and, and population health um, still hasn't developed that kind of um, universal sense of exactly how you um, identify what the right data are, what their quality are, how you can share them, where they're going to be comparable. So there's still a lot of work that has to be done technically on, on those kinds of things. At least that's, that just occurs to me as I was listening. The, the other question uh, that uh, came from, from our listeners that I wanted to raise with you is, we've talked about some fairly complex uh, challenges in, in the course of this conversation. Uh, but our, one of our listeners said, uh, you know, when COVID-19 hit and everybody was asked uh, to make sure that they social distance, to wear a mask and to wash their hands, uh, there, are, there are contexts in which people can't wash their hands readily because they don't have access to the means to do that, namely clean water. So, she, so he or she, the, uh, this listener um, asked, how do we ensure that the basics are covered when we're trying to deal with uh, with major health crises like this? That you know that people are concerned about um, uh, you know access to water and sanitation, uh, which obviously has an impact on health outcomes, whether it's COVID nineteen or or um, or NCDs. Um, and you know maybe you can just give us a perspective on that um, uh, from your experience. Sheila. Yeah, I think I, yeah, thank you very much. I think I alluded to that when I was saying that, uh, you know, engaging communities and ensuring that they, you know, they bring in that perspective of the lived experience at community level. Uh, that's exactly what happened. And where civil society was able, and they, they, there was no big study needed. You know, governments or politicians are aware of seeing which villages, let's say in our communities, would need, have no water. So that it was a really a question of then civil society saying for us, for this particular village, this particular city, there are pockets that have no water here and there. And because of the seriousness of COVID-19, you know, where there had been no money, suddenly money appeared in some countries. And we saw, uh, you know, those localities being supplied with water and also actually that insurance that there were, there was soap and water. Now in a country like Botswana, soap and water were available, but there were localities that had no water. You are aware of that, the Kalahari Desert and all that, suddenly boreholes were dug so that people can then have that access to water, to sanitation, to ID. So where a government you know, makes that political choice to say we're going for help, that happens. But then there are some governments that don't do that. So thank you. Yeah, well, thank you. And Dr. Bubul and then uh, Katie Dane. Uh, yes, uh, I again uh, yeah, provide some importance the linking between the wash and the health. Uh, very much, I mean, linked uh, with not only health, even for, with the nutrition as well. So this is a very much uh, important question that uh, if you have no any access to have the uh, better, uh, I mean, water or better hand washing uh, access. So how will uh, you improve the situation? So in this uh, uh, line, I want to give some example from Bangladesh, I mean, good practices. That is uh, the uh, 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 task shifting uh, of the different departments, especially those who works with uh, wash sectors. Uh, so this might work well uh, another way, way is uh, identifying uh, the 
uh, importance of the civil society. They can actually work here as well as engaging the parliament members into uh, the actions in their own local areas. So these three things might work well uh, to improve the wash situation uh, in a country uh, when government take uh, some uh, uh, priorities uh, in these sectors. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. And Katie, you'll, you have the last word. Just, just very briefly, I mean, I think this also brings us back to, you know, conversations around what we mean by universal health coverage as well. I mean, obviously, you know, countries are are all focused around um, UHC and have their own national, you know, UHC responses. But I think one of the, the challenges that we have is that often um, public health and social determinants uh, kind of fall off the UHC agenda. Um, and the focus is mainly on the kind of clinical side of things in terms of the health services. So I, I think, you know, within UHC, we need to be continuously reminding governments that this should also be focusing on the, the upstream prevention agenda as well. Absolutely. Well, um, alas, we've run out of time, but, uh, but our panel didn't disappoint. This has been a fascinating discussion. Um, we've covered some really important aspects of, of these issues. And I want to thank all of you uh, for your contributions and the time that you've, uh, that you've uh, given us for, for this conversation. I'd like to turn back now to uh, Dr. Sandra Galea, who will uh, just give us a few words on the next steps for the 3D Commission and, uh, and close us out. Uh, Sandra, over to you. Well, first of all, thank you, Jeff, and, and thank you to all the panelists. What a really interesting, uh, fascinating conversation. You know, it, we, we have all in the world been living through a terrible time. There's no, there, there's no other way of thinking of a pandemic, but it's a terrible moment. But uh, at the same time, I feel like it is perhaps uh, intrinsic to human character to try to find uh, the silver linings in terrible moments. And I think one of the silver linings in this terrible moment is the opportunity to reflect on things that matter and that will matter in the long term. And I have found the sharpening of our thinking around what it is that we need to take in mind, keep in mind to promote health, to create a healthier world that is resilient to future threats like this, to be perhaps one of the best silver linings of the moment. And I think it will be so if we keep it in the forefront of our mind. The uh, work of the commission really is one small piece of that as I see it. We, uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, we started this work before the pandemic and we've really been going through it and thinking through it together um, during the time of pandemic. And as you heard in this conversation, I think it is the input and the perspectives of people from all over the world that are really trying to focus us on understanding what are the drivers of health? How do we measure them? As uh, uh, Katie, um, I believe uh, quoted um, uh, former WHO, um, uh, Secretary General uh, Chan, Dr. Chan saying, how do we make sure we measure it so we can do something about it to the end of making better decisions for health. In terms of next steps on the commission, uh, we will be moving to finalizing the report. The report will be released in September and we'll have a series of uh, public fora like this. As I said, it'll be rooted geographically uh, with six around the world come September and also a formal launch at the, UN, at the UNGA then in September. And I would invite everybody here to join us. And most importantly, I'm delighted to have you all uh, be part of this uh, webinar this morning. I only hope, I only wish we could do it in person, but there will be many opportunities for uh, conversations like this in person in the coming years, I hope. To everybody, thank you for being a part of this. Uh, depending on your time zone, uh, have a, rest, uh, a good rest of your day, a good afternoon, and a good night. Thank you, everybody. Thanks. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. See you in the Caribbean soon. <laughs> yes, definitely. <laughs> and I'll hopefully see you in Africa as well. Yes, in the yes. <laughs> thank you, Sheila. Uh, thank you, thank you Neil. Thank you, Tamil. Thank you, Kate and Take care. Uh, Jeffrey. Thank you Bye -bye. all. Thanks. And Bye -bye. all are welcome to Bangladesh. Yeah. Yes, yes. Very much. Visiting all, all these regions. Thank you. Bye bye. Yes. Bye. And Take Dr. Care. Jennifer yeah. has my regards to the Windy City.